test, test. We are very excited about being here tonight at the, uh, what is this, 44? 44. 44th uh, Southeastern Lectureship. Right Regional here, Lectureship. Regional Lectureship yes, right here in Huntsville, Alabama with Brother Floyd Rogers. And just would like to welcome everybody here tonight. Please, we welcome you and we're thankful that everyone is interested in the lectureship and in God's word being proclaimed in this simplicity form. Amen. What a blessing. What a blessing. We've had a wonderful time. Wonderful, wonderful time. time We're going to have a great time tonight as well as tomorrow morning. Yeah, tell them a little bit about tonight. Tell them about tonight. Tonight we're having a panel discussion of the various issues within the Church of Christ. Dr. Barclay, Richard Barclay will be speaking. Brother Keaton will be actually over the panel. And we're going to encourage you all to come. And there's going to be some serious questions that's going to be asked and answered. They're going to be taken directly from the Word of God. And I promise you, you will enjoy it. We're going to live stream it. But I would rather for you to be here in person so that you can have a great time. All right, guys. You heard it from Brother Rogers himself. Uh, we just thank y'all for tuning in and make sure you tell everybody about it. And he's absolutely right. From here on out, we need you here. We need to fill this room up and just bless the people of God. Amen. Amen. Looking forward to it. God bless you. God bless you. And have a wonderful time tonight. Exactly. Tell all your friends to tune in. How you doing, man? Good, sir. You are. What are you, you going to be doing? What? The song I'm leading for you. So good. 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 One more. One or two others. What's your full name? John
May I have your attention, please? We're getting close to starting our devotional for tonight. And if you would, we would have you to move closer to the front. This is for, uh, so we can have good visuals. Uh, move close as you can to the front. And uh, we're not going to hurt you. Just come on down front and amen. It's a beautiful thing when people are cooperative and uh huh. Amen. Amen. We have some holdouts back there not moving, but we're going to go forward. Thank you so very much. We appreciate it. We're going to have to Darius Beard to come at this time. He's going to word the opening prayer, and after which, we're going to have a few uh, congregational selections. Uh, and get into our program for tonight, which will be a panel discussion that we are eagerly awaiting. So, Brother Beard. Please, go, let's go to God, our Father, in prayer. Uh, Father God in heaven, we come tonight, God, thanking you, Father, for your blessings. Uh, we thank you, God, for allowing us to come to this place tonight to assemble together. We're thankful, Father, for the opportunity whenever we can give you glory, give you praise, and give you honor. We pray for the man of God tonight as he stands behind this sacred desk to preach your word. We pray, God, that we'll allow your word to have free course in our lives so we can live and be what we need to be for the cause of Christ. Lord, we love you. We adore you. We cannot live without you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to ask Brother Williams if he would come and lead us in a few selections. I, I'm not sure if all of the panelists are here. I do see where we're going to have, shortly after this, we're going to have uh, Brother Richard Barclay, who will be the moderator for this panel discussion, Brother Leroy Butler, Jefferson Carruthers, Andrew Harrison, and Harold Red will uh, discuss some of the issues and uh, church issues, as it were, that we are facing, uh, and they're going to give their perspectives on it. So, but at this time, we're going to begin our singing and asking Brother Williams to come around and lead us in a few songs. When we reach that city of the new Jerusalem, Lord, we'll sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by, Lord, and how the ransom singers will together lift their hymn, Lord, and we'll sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by, oh, what joy, what Mighty chorus. 
position uh, on the stage area. We're going to begin as soon as we get everybody in place. All the panelists, that would be Brother Barclay, Brother Butler, uh, Brother Carruthers, Brother Hairston, and Brother Harold Red. And uh, I know they're here, but I've been noticing they've been drifting in and out. And uh, so I guess we'll just continue to operate until they get here. But I want to say this on, on uh, Brock, Dr. Gilmore's behalf. This lectureship has been the theme alone in times like these. And, you know, of course, then uh, the idea is that we are facing some difficult challenges today. And uh, even since we've been here, some other stuff has happened. And so we need to be filled with Jesus for sure. Do we not? Amen. But I've been been enjoying myself immensely. It's a beautiful theme. It's a timely theme. Uh, and I've, I've heard some dynamic speaking and I've gotten a few shouts in myself. I don't know about the rest of y'all, but I've gotten, gotten a few shouts in. Again, we want those of you who will uh, work with us to come forward as much as you can to the front uh, so that the visual going out can be uh, look like we have some folk in here. Amen? You know, that's the way they do it on TV, you know. Yeah, so we're going to do it like that. Y'all going to work with us? Again, a few holdouts. Nobody's moving in the very back. All right, she's getting up now. He's getting up. Come on. God bless you. Amen. All the panelists, if you would make your way to the uh, stage area, we can prepare to get into our discussion for uh, this evening. I'm excited about this and uh, as to what might be uh, talked about. Uh, from these men, all of these men are very capable, and so we are thanking God for them. Uh, and Brother Barclay will be the moderator, uh, and again, Brother Butler, Carruthers, Hairston, and Red, respectively, will be the panelists. Thank you, and again, God bless you.
Well, good evening. How's everybody doing? We do want to uh, welcome you to this uh, panel discussion uh, here on tonight. I'm Richard Barclay. Uh, we are joined up here by some very capable and competent uh, men of God. Uh, starting on my far left there, there is Dr. Jeffrey uh, Carruthers uh, from the Lord's Church in Winston-Salem, uh, North Carolina. Uh, next to him uh, is, and uh, Dr. Carruthers serves the church both as uh, an elder uh, and the evangelist. Uh, adjacent him is Leroy Butler, uh, who serves the Lord's Church there uh, in Valdosta, uh, Georgia, uh, who too serves uh, the Lord's Church there as both an elder and the uh, evangelist. And to my uh, far right over here uh, is Dr. Uh, Andrew J. Uh, Harrison, who has I've been at the Simpson Street Church for more than 50 years. Uh, in fact, he was there right after uh, Noah docked the ark. Uh, so uh, he's been there uh, for a moment and uh, been in that place that long. He knows where all of the bones are buried. In fact, I suspect he has buried most of them. Uh, but uh, just a uh, brilliant uh, mind. And uh, uh, our MC also uh, for the night uh, is our uh, esteemed uh, uh, brother uh, uh, sitting right here. Listen, uh, what I'm going to do is this. Uh, uh, since I'm just the moderator up here, I'm just fielding uh, your questions. I have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, to ask these men myself, but I'll hold mine till later on uh, in the program. Uh, uh, I have, uh, when I was doing the undergraduate study at East Texas Baptist College in Marshall, Texas, a uh, long, long, uh, long, long uh, time ago, uh, I, was a, I am a former uh, Baptist pastor, uh, but when I learned better, I did better. Uh, and I've been preaching the gospel for more than uh, 47 years. I remember my New Testament professor, uh, Dr. Simmons, uh, who told us, the preacher boys, that when you prepare your sermons and when you study the Bible, uh, you have both your Bible and the newspaper. Uh, you need to not only be biblical, you also need to be relevant. Uh, you need to know what the Bible says, but you also need to know what's going on uh, in Washington, D.C., New York City, uh, these places where so much takes place uh, in our country. Uh, and so uh, hopefully before this discussion is over, we can deal with some of these uh, hurricanes and uh, uh, earthquakes and uh, these mass shootings uh, how does the church not only uh, prepare, but also respond? Uh, we cannot keep our heads uh, in the sands as if uh, these issues are not relevant and they do not affect the church. Uh, in fact, you recognize a couple Sundays ago, uh, folk not only brought a gun to church, they used it uh, right there in Tennessee. Uh, how does the church prepare uh, for that? I mean, uh, are we all going to have to start packing? Uh, and so hopefully we can get into some of those issues before uh, this is over. Uh, each man have uh, been given a responsibility to, uh, to talk about a certain area. Uh, and so I'm going to let each of them uh, come up here, introduce their area uh, of concern. And then what I want you to do, one or two things, uh, either write a question out, uh, bring it up here to me, or be prepared. Uh, to stand up. Uh, hopefully we'll have a microphone there for you. Uh, and uh, ask the question based upon the subject areas uh, in which uh, they, uh, they are uh, talking about here tonight. We'll give them about 
about five, seven minutes, fellas. Uh, and uh, uh, rather than me pulling your coattail, uh, uh, because I ain't packing, uh, uh, so rather than me starting a fight with you, uh, I just put the, uh, uh, the timer up here so when it goes off, uh, you'll know what to do. Uh, Leroy, we'll start with you. Thank you, Dr. Barclay, and good evening, everyone. It's a delight to be here and to be asked to be a part of this panel uh, in discussing some of the things that certainly concern us all as we tabernacle down here and as we uh, make an effort to do all things uh, that are pleasing and acceptable in the sight of God. I've been asked to uh, address briefly the topic or the subject of how to establish biblical authority. Uh, we're living in a time now where it looks like anything and everything goes and we certainly want to make sure that we are acting in accord with God's will as we carry out our individual responsibilities in our local congregations and establishing uh, uh, authority uh, for what we do. I uh, only have about five to seven minutes, so this is certainly a, a very uh, involved uh, subject, but I'm going to try to do it in a way that um, uh, we don't spend a lot of time uh, mining down into a lot of detail, but let me just begin uh, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. Of course, all of us preachers learn to quote that one as soon as we learn to preach. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Now, we, are, we recognize that that passage refers to both Old and New Testament scriptures. But today we live under the New Covenant and uh, the Old Covenant, of course, is for our learning, uh, but the New Testament is for our living. Uh, the New Testament constitutes the will of Christ for man today. And the sum total of its teaching on any subject is in fact heaven's will on that matter. And to add to or subtract from or change or pervert the New Testament and the word of God is to disrespect heaven's authority. Now you may recognize that expression, heaven's authority, Matthew 21, you remember Jesus was teaching in the temple and he was approached by the chief priests and elders and they were, he was asked by what authority do you teach these things and where did you get this authority from? Now Jesus wasn't offended by the question. And every teacher, every preacher must deal with those exact questions. Every religious practice has to be put to the scrutiny of those two questions. Now I tell you, Jesus says, uh, I'll tell you by what authority, but until I'll do it, but you must first tell me. Uh, the baptism of John. Was it, was it from heaven or was it from men? Uh, they say we cannot tell. Now that's unacceptable, that's dishonest and that's disingenuous. 
And so Jesus, of course, then said, because you won't tell me, then I won't tell you. But it comes down to this. Is it from heaven or is it from men? Now, we know that the New Testament is God's final revelation to man. And so we must be concerned with methods of determining what is authorized by the New Testament. Now, good time is flying. Let me see if I can do this. Uh, go ahead and just kind of cut to the chase. How do we establish the authority of Christ? Three ways, and most of us are familiar with these, by precept, example, or necessary inference. I didn't come to bring you nothing new, so y'all understand. Uh, what is a precept? Precept is a direct command expressly stated. Uh, for example, this do in remembrance of me. That's a direct command expressly stated, Luke 22, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, uh, uh, where we, Paul is talking about the Lord's Supper, uh, uh, same uh, words expressed, go ye into all the world, uh, preach the gospel to every creature, that's a, uh, a direct command expressly stated, husbands love your wife, uh, direct command expressly expressly stated. You all get that, right? Uh, then there's example, approved apostolic example is how I was taught it, and that's how I usually express it. Approved apostolic example. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, you remember Paul says, be ye followers of me even as I uh, also am of Christ. This lets us know that uh, the apostles, uh, in their uh, behavior, the things that they did, uh, constitute for us approved apostolic examples. Upon the act, uh, Acts 20 and verse 7, upon the first day of the week, uh, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached on to them. And so when we emulate the apostles, we know we have heaven's approval. And then quickly, necessary Inference. Necessary inference is really an inescapable conclusion. Now, when a command is neither expressly stated nor specifically exemplified, God's will, heaven's approval, may be determined by a logical deduction. Now, the key is necessary. When we talk about necessary inference, things that are just probable or likely can't be binding. It must be an inescapable Conclusion. Let me give you an example real quick. Exodus 20 and verse number 8. Well, Acts 20 verse 7. Let's stay with that. Upon the first day of the week. Usually we are challenged with that. And it says the Bible doesn't say every first day of the week. But there is an inescapable conclusion uh, when we compare, for example, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Jews understood that to mean every Sabbath day. And so it is a logical conclusion and uh, altogether reasonable to conclude that upon the first day of the week, the first day of the week, uh, means every first day of the week. Oh, y'all get what I'm saying? So, so, so this is basic, and, uh, and that's what uh, uh, we uh, want to just share with you as the uh, a method, the method, there are three methods of determining uh, biblical authority. Now I could get into specific uh, authority versus generic authority, uh, and, but my time, is, uh, my time is up. So, so that at least gives you the three, and every, every preacher in the house uh, that preaches under the COC sign uh, recognize that uh, uh, precept, <laughs> precept, example, and necessary inference has been the mainstay that we've used over the decades to determine biblical authority. God bless you. Thank you, Leroy. Um, Jeff? I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Carruthers. The uh, 
name certainly is Jeff. Amen. So we appreciate uh, this opportunity to come and share uh, on this uh, panel. We're thankful for what uh, Brother Butler has shared uh, related to how to establish uh, biblical authority. Um, I work in the area of uh, uh, a couple of areas. One of those is historical theology, which looks at um, people's ideas about uh, God and doctrine over the span of the centuries, and it changes from century to century. Um, another area is hermeneutics, what Brother Butler has spoken on tonight, and, and that is biblical authority. And part of the discussion um, we are asked to engage in tonight has to do with the uh, presentation of, uh, I'll call it music, uh, in Churches of Christ. Churches of Christ distinct and different from other churches that have an origin of existence uh, in the United States uh, in the restoration kind of construct are what are called a cappella. A cappella is generally thought of in terms of without the accompaniment of instrument. The word actually has to do with, uh, it is a, a, an Italian word having to do with according to what was done in the chapel. Um, churches, for the most part, for many centuries, uh, when it came to the organized assembly, uh, used only voices uh, for music. It is um, established in the New Testament uh, that uh, there is no command uh, for persons to accompany their music with mechanical instruments of music. But I should say, hermeneutically speaking, it is incorrect also to say that under the Old Testament, or what some call the First Testament or the Hebrew Bible, that every individual was commanded uh, to use an instrument. They were not commanded to use an instrument under the Old Testament. It was an allowance, but it was not a commandment. One would look in vain in the New Testament to find um, a commandment for every member to play an instrument, and I would expect it to be so because uh, if that were a command, what would also be uh, a part of that would be that everyone would have to learn to play an instrument. And y'all know how y'all were in band class. You wouldn't even practice your flute and things back then, your sax, your trumpet. Uh, folk would sure enough have to go to hell if it were based upon their ability to learn an instrument. But the voice uh, was sufficient in both the Old Testament and the New Testament uh, as a expressive tool by which to uh, honor God. And I want you to know that the music uh, admonitions can come in uh, several categories. One is a purpose category, and that is teaching and admonishing one another uh, is purpose while at the same time uh, giving thanks to God and praise to God. And those two work together in Hebrew, uh, Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16. Note that uh, that singing is not solely for expression to God. I hear people say, coming to the assembly, I'm here and I'm going to sing if I have to sing all by myself. Well, that's not church singing. Church singing has the purpose of teaching and admonishing one another. In addition to that, the melody of the heart 
is not anything any brother or sister will ever hear from you. No one can hear what's going on in your heart. And the Bible was not substituting the sound of the heart for the sound of the harp, singing and making melody in the heart or singing with grace in the heart has particularly to do with what Jesus is referring to when he says these people honor me with their, their lips. You know, they, they're doing one thing with their lips and their tongues, but he says their hearts are far from me. One can make a great sound with his or her lips and still the heart cannot be making melody before God or having grace before God. And there are a lot of people who sing today uh, who uh, misunderstand that if I'm going to re uh, represent myself as one singing praises to God, I ought to live right. Amen. <laughs> I ought to live right. It does no good to parade choruses of people before us singing uh, with 25 people and three of the singers are pregnant and not married. That's not singing with grace in my heart to the Lord. Or five of the men are not paying their child support. That's not singing with grace. Y'all didn't ask for this, did you? Right? But, but just that so purpose, and then as a result, singing as a result, is any Mary, let him sing songs. And then possibly as a sacrifice, if Hebrews 13, 15 is talking about singing at all, it says giving thanks unto God. And we'll say more about uh, all of that later on. My time is up in three, two, one. Thank you. Our next speaker, and then we'll be ready to uh, field questions uh, from you based upon what uh, each of these men have said in terms of uh, a summary uh, statement. Uh, Dr. Harrison. First, I would say this is my pleasure to be here this evening and to share in this opportunity and as chairman of the annual Southeastern Lectureship, uh, this is also an effort to start bringing to us an agreement, and we appreciate Brother Harold Gilmore making this possible this evening. We sometimes are accused of dodging issues, not facing issues face up, one on one, and that's what this, we ought to be about, and we're doing our best to get started on that. Secondly, I would say to you, as, uh, as far as questions are concerned, I often say to uh, the Simpson Street, at Simpson Street, I guess I say I used to say, but uh, since I'm, I'm retired from there, uh, that you are in full opportunity to disagree with everything we say. Don't worry about whether you agree with what we say. Consider it. Weigh it. And see how much sense it makes. That's what we're really after, challenging us at the base issues. What is the authority of the minister? Uh, it's a provocative type of approach. And our aim is to get us to thinking cooperatively and intelligently regarding all of these issues. What is the pointed meaning of the text? Is it in context? Uh, what we're talk is what we're talking about, is that the same as what Paul was saying, was talking about? You can't change the context and follow the scripture. You got to do it, be the same situation. Is it totally applicable? to what we're talking about. That's what we're looking for and trying to teach us to consider that. I cannot bring my thoughts to the scripture and then read the scripture in the light of my thinking. I must read the scripture as it is written and, and with the purpose in mind when it was written. So what does the Bible really authorize? What is the authority of the minister scripturally? And I think it's a big issue in our brotherhood a, a tremendous issue that needs to be addressed because you have, as God's man, one of the most prolific and important carriers there can be. So he cannot be disturbed or pushed out of line because the message has got to come straight 
and we cannot afford to obstruct that message. So how do we, uh, what, what is his freedom? Who has the right to set in on him and limit what he says if God doesn't limit it? So now that, that's really what we are after because I think it's critical. And if we don't find the answer and bring ourselves to it, we're gonna be in real trouble and end up in a place after life that we don't prefer to be. We search for the scriptures, we, we uh, search to know the point and meaning and the contextual situation. So what is the scripture really talking about? That's what we're after, that's what we're trying to deal with and uh, we struggle with that and we must be free to say what God said to us as he spoke to the prophets of old, as he speaks to us, so we must hear him as they were obligated to hear him. I think that's enough ground for us to get started though. Thank you. All right, so you've heard uh, three summary uh, statements, uh, the last of which talks about the uh, uh, ministerial uh, authority based upon uh, the historical and the literary uh, context of scripture. Uh, my New Testament professor in uh, graduate school was Dr. Gordon Fee. Uh, he used to tell us uh, all of the time that the Bible was not written to us, but it was written for us. It was written to somebody else. And so what we have to do uh, is to hear what they heard in their own historical context. And then, the, because whatever God said to them, he's saying exactly the same thing to us. But how does one apply what God said to them in their historical uh, context. Uh, we appreciate that so very, very, very much. All right, uh, okay, it's, it's open for questions now. Uh, we have a mic uh, right here. Uh, if, you, if you've written your question out, if you would simply have one of these men uh, to uh, 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 bring us the question, we'll look at it. Uh, or if you choose to come to the, uh, uh, the mic and uh, articulate your question, we'll entertain it. It's amazing how that uh, we have a lot of questions out in the hallways. Uh, all right, whosoever will. Okay, while you all are thinking about, okay. Where, where do we get the authority from the scripture for a congregation to go from a cappella to instrument in the congregation? Where do we get the authority from Scripture for Rather, congregational where do, where singing? Where do they get the, the authority? Where do that congregation and the Church of Christ get the authority to have instrument in the worship? Okay. Jeff, I think that was a, that was your area. The uh, churches that. I have known recently to go instrumental do not say that they are going instrumental because they have a new scriptural insight. Um, whether we're talking about our own brothers uh, in African American churches or Caucasian churches, usually what they have said is to make something to the degree of making themselves more palatable and relevant uh, in culture. And uh, their conclusion is that if uh, our assemblies have instruments of music, then our churches will grow. But I know a whole lot of denominational churches got all kinds of instruments and are not growing. Uh, and it becomes just a matter of preference. It, it, it has nothing to do, to do with what one finds in scripture, neither does it have anything to do with historical precedent or even uh, some uh, newfound discoveries related to the language of the, 
of the uh, of the Bible. Uh, there's just no no command that they're basing that on. It's uh, strictly preference, from what I understand. Okay, I think Dr. Carruthers was clear in saying that there is no biblical authority for that. It's relegated to the area of preference. All right, there's a written question that says, why are we not all speaking the same thing? Well, I'm trying to be just as politically correct as I can be, but I don't want to start pointing the finger here. Uh, 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 Dr. Harris? Why are we not all speaking the same thing? I, I guess if we could be a little more specific on that question, speaking the same thing about what? This question is, is why are we not speaking the same thing? Uh, I would say that's because we are reading the text. If we're reading the text, we're reading it differently. With a different background, a different set of thinking, et cetera, and not sufficient information. What do you say? You want up closer? Okay. So I think that the reason we do, we do, not, we do not, are not speaking the same thing, and, I've, and I gather from that we're speaking congregationally, why are we congregationally different? or in a congregation while we aren't all together is because we read with a, sometimes with a liberty. When I was doing some studies, I was uh, told, matter of fact, my uh, degree, from, from my doctorate degree uh, on the women's act, acting in, 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 in the churches of Christ, uh, I ran across some reading and it said that people read the Bible the way they are taught to read it. I read the Bible like the Church of Christ taught me to read it. And I was given certain positions prior to reading the Bible that helped me find what they told me I was going to find. Now that's not necessarily prejudice, but it sets you up to predetermine what you're going to believe. My denominational friends read the Bible from a different point of view. I grew up in a home that you didn't see any alcoholic beverages in our refrigerator. <laughs> no alcoholic beverages. Then I met people whose children were exposed to alcoholic beverages. They thought altogether different about alcoholic beverages than I did. So it's our early exposure that helps us to think, and we have to dig into that as preachers and as ministers, as elders and church leaders, is why are these people thinking the way they think? So it, it, it's how we approach the scriptures, what we are told, the scriptures teach, and how we read them. And uh, uh, that was enlightening to me and helpful to me. It kind of changed my course of studying even at a mature age and having preached for Simpson Street for a number of years by then, that impacted how I read the scriptures. I tried to get out of what my mother said or what anybody said, objectively reading the Bible. And that's difficult to do. That's the reason why I say, to, uh, uh, my, I have a son sitting back there and uh, people who worship at Simpson Street, sometimes when I start my sermons, I, I said, now don't bother to argue with me this morning. <laughs> you can think however you want to think. You're free to think however you think. But listen to what I say. And see how much sense it makes. Then you free them up. They don't need to be arguing with me while I'm trying to preach. So it's a lot of things, very good question. A lot of things impact. And I'll, I'll cut off with any, any, any of you about anything, sir? Uh, uh, how, do we, how do we square that, what, what you just said, most insightful, with Leroy's um, hermeneutical triad? Because based upon that hermeneutical triad, uh, if we all use that exclusively, that triad, then wouldn't we all kind of come out looking the same and sounding the same? Uh, and yet, uh, 
here is uh, uh, Dr. Harrison suggesting that uh, because we have been taught to read it that way, we kind of come to the same kinds of conclusions. Uh, and yet, uh, because using his term, uh, uh, when he reads the Bible more objectively, he may not necessarily come to the conclusion based upon that hermeneutical triad. Jeff. Well, 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 throw it over to him first and then I'll come to you, Jeff. Okay. The question was, why are we all speaking the same thing? Uh, using, uh, and I'm not questioning uh, the, 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 the hermeneutic triad. I got another question to ask about it, but, but using that hermeneutic triad, direct commands, um, uh, approve apostolic examples, uh, necessary inferences, wouldn't we kind of come to the same conclusions? I think we, we have a better chance of coming out with the same conclusion. Uh, it depends in part also with whether or not we are uh, properly interpreting the scriptures that we might be using as proof texts and supporting the particular position that we have. Dr. Uh, Harrison mentioned a moment ago about um, context, authorial intent, you know, all of that comes into play. So while you may be applying the three uh, uh, approaches, uh, the success of that is based upon whether or not you start with the right premise and the right understanding based on the scripture itself. So why are we not speaking the same thing? Uh, I don't pretend to know. I, I, can, I can guess at it and say that um, uh, there, there's probably a number of reasons why we're not speaking the same thing. We're not using the same approach. Uh, we're not skilled in the use of it. Uh, there can be a number of reasons why, I think. That, uh, 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 Jeff and I'll let you respond to that, but since you are the historical theologian, uh, could you help us to understand the origin of that uh, hermeneutic? Uh, where did it get started? Why, why did it get started? Most recently, uh, in our fellowship, the one who did a lot of work in that is uh, J.D. Thomas in Harmonizing Hermeneutics. And uh, uh, through the uh, decades, uh, he was very popular in leading um, hermeneutical, hermeneutical thought among us. And of course, there are others, but at a very grasping level, uh, harmonizing hermeneutics and other works by J.D. Thomas informed uh, um, our, our thoughts about command, example, and necessary inference. But I want to say, too, about uh, that particular approach hermeneutically to scripture, that there's still other work to, that is involved, even when uh, that is one's approach, uh, for those who are still students uh, and, and learning um, and trying to get a grasp on how we see the Bible. There's a, there's a Bible, there's a book, uh, Titled uh, entitled uh, the Bible made impossible. I think uh, Smith is the is the author and what you discover in that uh, in evangelical circles who or any circle where where the Bible is held in high regard by way of inspiration and infallibility and inerrancy uh, people have taken a similar approach uh, to determine what doctrine is and here's what I'm saying is in many evangelical circles, not only are we looking at command, example, necessary inference, but uh, what kind of uh, material are you coming to to ascertain what is the command, example, necessary inference? You've heard that the, the Bible is a constitution. Uh, Smith deals with this in the Bible uh, made impossible. It's a constitution. So we come to the constitution with command, example, necessary inference. Others have said uh, that um, it, it's a book of patterns. So we bring command, example, necessary inference, looking for uh, patterns. Uh, at the same time, we've heard that, uh, or people treat the Bible as a book of rules. And so they come to the text looking for rules. 
And you know we have a whole lot of that in the churches of Christ. Uh, we, 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 we tend to stay away from scriptures that say things like for freedom Christ has set us free because we don't like freedom in churches of, of Christ. But, but here's the truth about the text. The text uh, is a combination of different presentations of argumentation uh, and narrative. So, uh, you have some areas that are straight narrative, but the Bible is also composed of pithy sayings that are be ta to be taken not literally, but uh, you have to determine by context and, and time what the proverb or maxim uh, is about. It's also a book of poetry, and poetry is to be dealt with differently than is the narrative. Historical sections are not dealt, dealt with similarly to poetic sex, sections, and so there is much work to be done, but what happens uh, in many, with many of us in Churches of Christ is that we stop at, at the level of finding what pleases us, and we're not much interested in, in much else. And then a lot of our preachers in our generation are ill-trained, uh, amen, somebody. Uh, they've picked up a Bible and they've read a few passages and some congregation has made them the preacher because they feel like they're not gonna have much problems out of him. But preachers are to be students of the word of God and uh, who was that a minute ago saying that thank that's you, not Dr. to be Carruthers. abrogated, uh, that's not to be abrogated by, by persons in the, th th in thank the you. church. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. Uh, you see, you, you looking for a fight, Jeff. That's all you doing. Boy, I know you. Uh, so you just got an advanced course on hermeneutics at the graduate school level. Uh, I understand mechanical instruments aren't to be used during worship services, but what about at weddings and funerals? I understand mechanical instruments aren't to be used during worship services. What about at weddings and funerals? There, was, uh, there were different things commanded for different aspects of worship, even under the Old Testament. Some things that were used in, at one time or another, not necessarily used uh, uh, somewhere else. Uh, for example, you could, you could barbecue at home uh, anything that was not the firstling of the flock. Nothing wrong with setting something on an altar or a grill, but they made a distinction between what, what one did for the Lord and what one did in his personal life. I came up in a very traditional kind of environment. Um, and so even when we, we got married, and this was just recently, my wife and I, um, and I assume this morning many of you knew my, my wife because we, we do, do a lot of traveling, but you, you don't know, Sister Carruthers, could you stand one minute? Uh, it just, that, that's Sister Carruthers right there. She's had seven children. Every time she had a child, she, she, her age backed up five years, amen. But um, so when we had our wedding, we didn't, we didn't have instrumental music. We did use a song by one of our brothers, uh, uh, was Always and Forever, what's his name? Who, who sang that? Uh, yeah, yeah, so we just didn't have instruments of music uh, and there. And, and, uh, but uh, many people do use it for wedding, and a wedding is a different event than is a, a coming together of the assembly to offer praise uh, to God. Uh, we know there's a difference when Jesus talked about the prodigal son, I'm almost through. Uh, when the older son approached the house, he heard a couple of things. He heard music and dancing. Uh, and uh, Jesus is using that to tell the story of celebration in heaven, that heaven rejoices over one sinner that repents. And uh, that story has the music and dancing. Now, of course, that didn't go on in the Holy of Holies. If it did, nobody saw it there. All right. Uh, please look at 1 Corinthians 1.10, speaking the same. I mean, it's, that's a statement. I don't, whoever wrote this, do, do you have a question? Please look at 1 Corinthians 1.10. Would somebody give her a mic? Uh, she said it was the reference to the first question. Yeah, that's all. Okay, she 
see that pink avenue, but that, that scripture was. First Corinthians 110. Okay. Thank you. All right. Are there Christians in other churches beside the Church of Christ? Are there Christians in other churches beside the Church of Christ? Are there, are there Christians in other churches beside the Church of Christ? All right, uh, did y'all answer that? My, my back was turned, I mean. I think first of all, I think it's a very good question. And, uh, Put it up to you. Oh, very good question. And it's a relevant question. And I think that what we have to do with that question is be honest and considerate about it. I think there are people in other churches and outside the churches of Christ who are doing the very best they can and, doing, and, and obe being as obedient as they can and they are knowledgeable of the word and obeying it to the extent that they know. I think those people are in a good position with God. Our job is to search them out and define them and further mature them in faith. I honestly believe that because uh, it's, I, I find people in other churches who are just as convicted about right as I am. There's some uh, shortages in their lives that need to be called to their attention, and I take, I take my, my occasion to do that. Even with members of the churches of Christ, they're not all saved because they're in the church of Christ. They have to be corrected, they have, and anybody who refuses to mature in the face of truth is lost. And, and, and certainly those who are inclined searching for truth, trying to find it, I think God is on their side, they are on God's side, and, and, and deserve our every consideration. But just to point out that no, there's folk in other churches who are, who are, who are, who are right and who are saved, that's a different, diff, difficult question to deal with, and I would not uh, hazard to try to get into that because it's such a broader field. But I do have a great deal of respect for people who are outside of the church of, of, of the Lord as we know it and are doing the very best that they can and who are responsive to truth when I proclaim it to them and talk or are willing to sit down and study the word, they are in a safe, good position with God and are subject to salvation and eventually obeys the truth. All righty, thank you, sir. Um, this is a hermeneutical question. If we should start with preconceived principles, will that not sabotage our conclusions? If we start with preconceived start with what? Preconceived principles, will that not sabotage our conclusions? If I understand what you're saying, I, I think they, it, it, it could, but it doesn't have to. I don't think it doesn't have to sabotage. It's how you handle it. And, 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 and to me, that's another point of informed. Uh, uh, okay, and answer this one in light of, of what you're, uh, you, you, you're about to answer. How does, uh, how do we treat a brother who uh, who after honest objective study fundamentally differs from another brother. I don't understand. Okay. Um, you, you, you and I are reading a text. Okay. 
uh, we have read based upon our training, our life experiences, even our own theological leanings. And we honestly disagree. How then do I treat you and how do you treat me when we have honest, objective differences? In other words, uh, we are brothers, we are not Siamese twins. Okay. We've got a genuine difference. Yeah. yeah. You're my brother. Doc, this ain't my question, okay? Say <laughs> <Hey>, what? <laughs> you, you said, how do we relate? And how do we look, relate to people who, yeah. uh, who's our brother and genuinely differ? Yeah. Well, I relate to them as my brother whom I genuinely differ. Now, it, it, it depends on what we're talking about. And if, if, if scripture and truth is involved in that, that's a different matter. But we have a genuine difference about an issue that goes to the two of us, or whatever the case may be. I don't, follow, I don't, I don't see room for not fellowshipping with that. Okay, one final question in that same light. How much flexibility and difference can we tolerate before dividing a fellowship? Well, I think that goes to, when you reach the point of no progress and a refusal to learn and refusal to be considerate and to listen and consider the word, if he has a basic misunderstanding about the word, I can't condemn him for his lack of understanding. I can try to change that and continue to work with him. Okay, then what do we then do with brothers or congregations <laughs> who will choose to use a bass mic? Who does what? Refuse? No. Following up with how much flexibility and difference can we tolerate before dividing the fellowship? Well, I think I've given my response to that. Maybe one of these other gentlemen will say something. Okay. <laughs> Y'all take that mic from him, all right? Because this thing gonna get real personal up here real quick. Uh, okay, uh, Doc. Uh, Leroy. Let, let me, I, since the, 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 the previous question about preconceived principles sabotaging our conclusion, since that falls uh, kind of uh, probably over into what I was, uh, what I presented, uh, let me address that. Let me answer that this way. Preconceived principle, it depends on whether by the use of preconceived you mean to communicate that preconceived um, is not based upon a biblical principle. Now, uh, you know, you've got to apply principles in order to draw conclusions and arrive at uh, perhaps a proper understanding. Uh, principles won't necessarily sabotage your conclusion. Principles will lead you to the proper conclusion if your principles are, uh, are solid and if they are uh, legitimately based upon principles that you find in the Word of God. Okay. Let me let me say one thing about bass mics. Um, Projection of, of voice is not a new phenomenon. Uh, we, we arbitrarily decide which voice uh, we will project the most. Uh, the bass mic issue uh, is an issue that is created by people who have difficulty uh, with a change from the projection of one voice to the next, but it's also an absence of knowledge, I think, in some corners quarters 
uh, is called, uh, absence of knowledge is called ignorance. Uh, and I mean that in the kind way, they just don't, don't know. Um, and what we assume is that our electrical projection has no affinity with what might have transpired in the past with voices. Many of you know that I was on a, on a study tour uh, for 16 days in, in Israel, uh, at which time I was looking for evidences of, of practices um, in the first century. One of the places we visited uh, just to uh, give insight into the kinds of things they did with voices in the first century was, was one of the amphitheaters. And, 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 and let me do this real quickly. We were, we were in an, an, an amphitheater, and uh, it was 2,000 plus years old, and uh, it was made in a half circle. And what was there in the amphitheater, they, they, they had already figured out how to amplify voices, project voices. And so in the front, uh, right behind where people were standing, there were little holes cur carved into the cement and there were about eight uh, in that amphitheater so that when people came in there and they began to uh, use their voices a cappella, what happened is that the, the, the amplifiers picked up the voices and projected it out. Uh, in other words, they had eight microphones 2,000 years ago. Now we're arguing about can we have one? Ignorance is the basis of a lot of our arguments. We just don't know what we're talking about. And they had many ways of projecting voices. And even the synagogue, I sat, I sat down in a 2,000 year old synagogue. It was built for projection of the voice based upon its structure. And what we're arguing about today is can we project certain voices because we just All right, don't you, know. Doc. Amen. Okay. Um, apparently, uh, you, you all were a little tad bit too ambiguous for this querist who said, please give a direct answer. <laughs> yes or no, when possible. The question about being a Christian if not in the Lord's church. God only always put people in one church, and that's Christ's church. No one is in a church recognized by God unless it is the church of Christ. Uh, yeah, I, of Christ. I appreciate that, yes or no? Yeah, well, I'm not a concrete sequential thinker. A concrete sequential thinker is neither yes or no, I'm more abstract. And so, <laughs> I answered the question. There are only people in the church of Christ. Only saved people are in Christ's church. God only ever saved anybody in this dispensation who's in the church of Christ. Uh, that, 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 amen. All right. Um, do you believe a brother has to attend a college or seminary in order to be a preacher? No. All right, but I will. Somebody surely want to speak to, to training and the importance of training. And, and for uh, one of the things I really do appreciate about uh, uh, J.S. Winston, R.N. Hogan, Marshall Keeble, uh, uh, J.P. Holt, uh, Levi Kennedy, Brother Bowser, all those great uh, early pioneers of our fellowship. I remind young men across the country, uh, based upon this kind of question, and it's, it's a wonderful question. Those men believe that the young men behind them were going to need more than they had in order to carry the church forward. See, it was not my generation that started Southwestern Christian College. It was the generations before ours. In their thinking, in their mindset, they were willing to make the sacrifice 
because they knew that my generation and the generation behind me were going to need more than they had to give the church in order to carry it farther. We mustn't minimize a training uh, and education. Uh, folk, this is not 1960. This is not 1945. Uh, this is 2017. No, you do not. Uh, and, and I think it's interesting that this is perhaps the only context in which that kind of question can be asked. We won't ask it down at the doctor's office. We won't ask it down at the lawyer's office. In fact, we go in office looking at what's on the wall. I'm not on the panel, okay. Brother Butler was gonna say something about that, but I, I wanna say about those, those gentlemen too. They did not have degrees, but they were Bible scholars. One thing that happens in, in Bible study, if you will attend to the Bible, uh, you, that's what scholarship is. You don't have to have a degree to know necessarily what scholars have. One of the ways I, I got through my PhD program easily is that I was a Bible reader. One of the questions on my PhD comps put me right where I, Brer Rabbit would want to be in the briar patch or a black man distinguishing between collard green, mustard green, turnip greens. Can, can you tell me the different man? Yeah. So one of the questions on the PhD exam was, what is the book of Acts about? And, and their thing is they want to see what you leave out. So the question is, what's the book of Acts about? Please, please treat it thematically, structurally, historically. And when I got that question, I said, man, you must be kidding. This is a good day. What's the book of Acts about? I'm about to go. 28 chapters. You know, uh, but that didn't come from going to school. That came from reading the Bible at home. And uh, people can study to a, to a great degree at home and become very efficient, very knowledgeable of what the Bible is about. And that's what Hogan and others had going for them, and even Keeble. And uh, what we don't have enough of today uh, is Bible reading. And that's not to say that people don't need extra training, but that's a good start. I think we all want our doctors to have uh, good bedside manners. But we want them to know some physics too, don't we? And some anatomy as well. And the same thing should apply uh, in our fellowship relative to learning. Um, how can we bridge the gap between the generations in the church? How can we bridge the gap between the generations in the church? And to follow up on that, is there a succession plan to allow younger Christians more input and leadership roles in our brotherhood? Bridging the gap, um, I think in each of our individual congregations, uh, recently I uh, had a statement to make to the church as I began to look around and see um, that most of us, including myself, I'm a baby boomer. Uh, the elders, the deacons in my church, oh, in my church in terms of stewardship is Jesus' church, y'all. But uh, <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> I forgot who I was talking to in here. Uh, but my church in terms of stewardship, um, you, you, you have to recognize that uh, in many churches, in the church that I preach, uh, you know, the church is getting older and older, and it's beginning to be, uh, in some instances, more difficult to uh, relate to uh, the younger generation of people uh, in our churches and in our communities. Uh, what I have done personally is recognize that there is uh, a gap between me and how I think and how millennials think and how young people think. Uh, for me, I recognize that uh, there is a lack of 
competence in some areas in dealing with and relating to young folk. Uh, I'd like to think that I'm still able to relate to some extent, but utilizing and bringing along young men and young women in the congregation um, so that you can bridge the gap between generations. I think uh, it's already been implied giving young people opportunity. Um, you know, when I was coming along as a, as a young man desiring to preach, uh, an older preacher took interest in, in me and mentored me. And so that helped uh, establish the next generation coming along. There are a number of things I think can be done, but we need to be conscious of the fact that if we don't, if we don't address the problem, or address the issue, uh, some of us baby boomers are gonna be sitting up in that church all by ourselves and there won't be any young folk, any young folk there. So I think there needs to be an, um, a deliberate effort made uh, and to address address the issue, sit down and talk about it, and uh, also uh, provide opportunities for young people to come along. I'm blessed, I have a, several young preachers, for example, in the church where I am, and young people are stepping up in ministry. Now, I don't wanna drag, drag this out too long, but as I talk, then my, my, my thinking clear, clears up a little bit as well. We have 13 women ministries at Woodlawn. And most of those ministries are headed by uh, baby boom, baby boomers. And I challenged them a couple years ago to be conscious of the fact that if you don't start recruiting and reaching out to some of these younger women and young ladies in the congregation, uh, you know, us baby boomers gonna be in here all by ourselves. And it takes, it takes, first of all, an interest, uh, an interest in preserving and making sure that the church continues to be viable and we continue to be effective and we get everybody involved. Uh, it's not always easy to relate to young folk. We can get to the place where we think that they are just not, you know, if you're not careful, you'll be talking about them all the time. You know, the, these young folk, these young folk, I don't know where well, you gotta drop that attitude and realize that they are an important part of the church and they need to be mainstream and integrated into what is going on. There's just no substitute for one-on-one -on -one interest in, in, in the young people in our congregation. Thank you. Uh, let me ask this. How many of you still have the rotary telephone at home? The rotary telephone? One, two. Three, all right? Uh, I preached for three months last year uh, from this subject uh, topic heading. Uh, remember the past, embrace the present, prepare for the future. Look what just happened. How many of you have the rotary telephone? Now, in just a little while, see you may still have it in the house and it may still operate it won't be very long when they're no longer going to service that because it represents the past and it, it is headed to uh, a museum somewhere in Washington, D.C. <laughs> but I want you to watch this. How many of you got an iPhone? How many of you got an iPad? This is the present. We have to embrace it. And then thirdly, we got to prepare for the future. I was reading not long ago where the next, they're, they're planning of devising a phone right now where it's going to be in your skin. See, see, the stuff we used to see on Star Trek is, and the Jetsons, I'm talking to my crowd now, it, it's just right around the corner. See, our problem is our, our churches are still rotary in an iPhone age. Uh, I, I used to hear our elders say, uh, turn your phones off. And I had, I had to get up behind the elders and say, don't do that. I wasn't trying to contradict them. I just had them to understand that most of the people 
many of the people in our services bring their Bibles on your iPhone and on your iPad. We're going to have to embrace the technology. Uh, the late Dr. Anelius Crenshaw uh, was an excellent b uh, bridge builder, uh, reaching out. But Crenshaw wasn't the first one. The Keebles, the Hogans, the Winstons, they did it a long time ago, folks where they would take men, take little boys with them as they preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, Leroy, you were you part of that. Uh, and train them. And folk, we got to get back to that. Uh, one of my students is, is here, Andrew Braxton. Uh, very fine young man. Uh, and there's a whole lot he can learn uh, in academia. Uh, except on Sunday morning, folk come, folk come asking one question. Is there any word from the Lord? You done visited all of the hospitals. You done been down to the jailhouse. But on Sunday morning, folk don't care about that. They just want to know, what did the Lord tell you to tell me in terms that I can understand? Which means it's okay to sing Amazing Grace but at some point in that service, we got to sing the songs that the young people in their generation are singing. And y'all ain't saying nothing. Um, and then one last thing. You talk about the transition in our brotherhood. Uh, what about the young men? Okay, let's start practicing what we are asking. We appreciate the 50 years of leadership that Dr. Jack Evans gave Southwestern Christian College. But that baton has now been passed. And Crenshaw would have said that whenever you pass the baton, whoever you pass it to, you better make sure they are already running. The worst thing Crenshaw said we can do is for us to walk by the casket and find the baton is in his casket. People, this is a very fine generation of young men. They are passionate. But they're going to need us to be able to do with them what the Billy Washingtons and the R.N. Hogan's did with me. And this young man is, he's time consuming. Whenever he comes to town, I just tell Shirley, go on down to Walmart, uh, buy up a whole lot of food. How long he's gonna be here, I don't know. That's why you buy up a whole lot of food. But I take the time with him because somebody took the time with me. So if we want something better in the future, then right now in the present, we have to start preparing for what we ourselves want. Uh, one last note. Um, uh, earlier this year, uh, Dr. Seamster appointed me after 46 years of Dr. James Maxwell to be lectureship director the first thing that I did after praying and accepting responsibility, I organized and I asked to serve with me as lectureship director, Dr. Orpheus Haywood, in my judgment, one of the finest preachers in this day. I asked Dr. Jeremy Flowers, Dr. Robert Burth, each of them have matriculated at Southwestern Christian College. And I've asked them to work with me in leading the lectureship. Because people right now, we need to start preparing this generation right now in order to assume uh, the responsibility. Now, along the sound line, same line, somebody asked, in times like these, we need men of God to stand on truth. The teaching of some of our young ministers have changed 
They look for mega churches, the almighty dollar, and flashy cars. What happened to me in being humble? Okay, they, they want you to live in heaven and board on earth. All right, so guys, how y'all going to respond to that? Now, the, mind you, each one of these guys up here got flashy cars. I don't, I don't mean to demean the question, uh, uh, but all of them are wearing, if they ain't tailor-made, they're close to being tailor-made suits. All right. Uh, so, all right, fellas. Jeff. In uh, 1979, Brother E.C. Christman was still living, and uh, Brother R.N. Hogan and J.S. Winston stopped by Brother Maxwell's ministry class at Southwestern Christian College, and part of the counsel they were giving, giving then uh, had to do with the desire of the students then uh, for cars and shoes and clothes, and, and that always has been something that uh, all people have been concerned about. Everybody wants to live well. Unfortunately, in the minds of many of our members in Churches of Christ, they think it's humble to be poor, whereas poor can make you humble, not necessarily so. They also think that the person who takes nothing for his services is more uh, sincere than the person who uh, does, and that is false. What is to be questioned and what will help even ministry today is why members who receive services from preachers believe it's appropriate to do like they do tips when they go to a restaurant. Won't hardly leave one. <laughs> that is not a biblical model, and I, one of the things I try to teach members of the Church of Christ is that each member has a responsibility to its teacher, his teacher, Galatians 6 and 6. I, I don't mean, I'm not trying to be harsh, I'm just trying to be biblical. And, and, and I know where the narrative comes from in the American ideologies and, 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 and these, these things, but it was never biblically appropriate for any member of the church to believe that he or she did not have a responsibility to the man of God. And that's each and every member who's taught. And the other thing about it is, that if another member wants to do something for a man of God, that's not anybody else's business, Galatians 6 and 6. Let him who is taught in the word communicate, share all good things with the one who teaches. On Sunday morning, members come to church and they feel like, I don't owe anybody. If you're preached to, biblically speaking, you owe the man of God. And that's not something that elders even have a, have a right to, to step in. When I preach, I got elders here. Elders, stand up if y'all are mad. I got elders here. When I preach on Sunday morning, these elders here, that's Brother Oliphant, Brother Weathers, Brother Fox, they don't owe those elders anything. They owe me. I preach. Now, there's some money coming in they can deal with, but they don't. When I preach, the members owe me. And if I do well by what members pay me, I am not less a Christian than the millionaire Christian. I'm just blessed by God. And so part of what needs to change is our attitudes about preachers because a lot of young men don't want to go into preaching because they really believe that it's a call uh, to a monastic and poor lifestyle. And that's not, that's, not, that's not biblical. Now I'll let you have the nice answers. All right. Um, one last question and then uh, we'll get some comments on the, uh, the ones that I'll open up with. Uh, what about sisters? MCN programs during worship. I'm not sure what kind of programs you, you may be talking about. What about sisters, MCN programs doing worship? I, Sisters, I, I, I don't know if we have enough context and background to even to, 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 to respond to that. I didn't know we had MCs doing worship. <laughs> um, I, can't, I can't really relate to that. I yeah. the, the men have the responsibility uh, in terms of leading worship. 
so I can't relate to an MC okay. doing, my answer would be, we don't have MCs in worship. And if we did, it would be a brother. Yeah, I wish the question could have been a little more specific and we could have uh, addressed it that way. Uh, but in a minute, in a few minutes we have left. How does the church respond? How does the church prepare and respond to natural disasters? We've seen in the news uh, the hurricanes um, impact Houston, um, uh, Southeast Texas. Um, Florida, uh, how prepared are our churches for these kinds of events? How should we prepare and how should we respond? I think we have uh, perhaps an example uh, in scripture. Um, Paul responding to uh, the plight of poor saints in Jerusalem uh, because of famine and which would be in some sense a natural, depending on what caused the famine, but it would be somewhat of a natural disaster. Um, and Paul, of course, uh, went about to solicit and enlist the help of Gentile churches uh, to respond to the need of uh, what is presumably predominantly the Jewish uh, saints in Jerusalem. Now he based that, of course, on the fact that Gentiles were recipients in, uh, of the uh, spiritual uh, legacy or heritage of the Jews. And therefore they had an obligation uh, because they were recipients of spiritual things to share with the saints in Jerusalem their uh, physical, carnal, material, material things. But, but Paul went about to enlist the help of other congregations in a joint way to respond in compassion, uh, in empathy, toward those who were suffering in Jerusalem, and I think that's a good pattern, would suggest that it is okay uh, for churches to cooperate with one another uh, in, such, in such efforts. Okay, I understand that there's one final question. I just want to make one quick comment, and I don't want to- uh, Sir, uh, is it a question? No, it's not a question. I just want to make a comment. Okay. We're about five minutes from, from starting. If there's a quick question. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm sorry then. Okay. And with all due respect to, thank you. Um, listen, you've been wonderful. Uh, come on, give yourself a hand. <laughs> ain't, ain't, ain't nobody cussing. Uh, and that's a wonderful thing. Uh, we're brothers, we're not Siamese twins, uh, and we're going to have to learn how to just to, uh, to get along. Um, I, uh, I told our church on Sunday that uh, uh, using a football metaphor, that in the game of football, there are three teams that take the field, offense, defense, and then the team of officials. Each one of those teams, whether they're the Atlanta Falcons or the Dallas Cowboys, have their own playbook. But whatever play they call from that playbook has to always be consistent with the guidebook. And the guidebook is provided by the NFL office in New York. So whatever play you call, it's okay. We don't call the same plays that Dr. Haywood called over at West End 
uh, or at Boulder Crest or at Simpson Street or Camp Creek. Uh, we got different playbooks, but whatever play we call people has to be consistent with the guidebook. And the guidebook is the Bible. And you, you can't change the fact that in football, it's 10 yards for every first down. And you can't move the goalposts when your kicker miss. Those rules don't change. We need to appreciate the fact that the Bible is our guidebook. Uh, but my play may not work in your scheme. Uh, so let's always be reminded of the fact that uh, Leroy open up with it. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. The Bible is our guidebook. So let's go back to our place. Use the playbook in line with what the guidebook says. Thank you again for being here on tonight. God bless you. Can we uh, get Brother Barclay a hand? Because he, we really appreciate his leadership on the night. I know he had as much to say as all of us. Thank you, Brother Barclay. Amen. <clears throat> I would ask if all minds are clear, but no sense in asking that. Amen. <laughs> We just go. We go. <laughs> we gonna do like Dr. Jackson said last night. Let the good times roll. That's what we gonna do? This has been interesting, and uh, we really need more of this. Um, but I don't know if we can take it. Amen. We come in thinking one way, and some of us going out maybe somewhat perplexed. But we are working out after a while. We're going to let Dr. Gilmore come and, uh, and appreciate all of the men who were panelists. And uh, <laughs> Brother Barclay, a de facto panelist. <laughs> de facto panelist. <laughs> Hater. Uh, uh, but you, you, I learned a long time ago, you can't, you can't choose your own kinfolk. Uh, listen, I mentioned... In passing, I'm, I'm lectureship director for uh, Southwestern after 46 wonderful years of Dr. Maxwell. One of the things that we're doing this year uh, at the lectureship at Southwestern uh, is to produce a souvenir program book to honor him uh, for four, his 46 years of wonderful service uh, at our uh, school. We encourage you uh, to go to our Facebook page uh, Southwestern, uh, see me uh, in order to take an ad out in, in that book to honor uh, Dr. Maxwell. I don't know of any other man uh, uh, alive who has influence in his classes more people uh, than did Dr. Maxwell. A lot of these men, young men, uh, men who are preachers today were trained uh, by Dr. Maxwell, and I think it's a fitting tribute to him. We're also honoring him with a banquet uh, Monday of uh, the lectureship. Uh, and so we would that you would uh, not only come, uh, participate uh, in our uh, lectureship, uh, but please take an ad out uh, to thank him for 46 years uh, of service to Southwestern Christian College. God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Barclay. Uh, I'm going to be quick tonight. Um, every Wednesday evening at the uh, Southeastern Lectureships, we dedicate this time to take up a contribution for the Youth Conference. The Southeastern Lectureship is the mother of the Southeastern Youth for Christ Conference. It is held the third week in July and 2018. It'll be the third week of July at Georgia Southern University in Statesboro, Georgia. We encourage you to please send your kids uh, to the youth conference. We have a very, very good conference. And we start from ages five upward, 
And so if you have not been participating, please send your kids to the uh, youth conference. So at this time, what we're going to do is we try to take up a contribution to make sure that we keep the cost down to make it affordable for all of the kids who attend the conference. You help us by giving a very liberal contribution to help us to defray the cost. And many times kids come that cannot afford to come at all. By your love gift, your donation, it help us to be able to allow them to come for five days at a discounted price. So right now we're going to ask that you please help us in this great endeavor by digging deep in your wallets, your purses, and giving a very generous contribution to help our young kids. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. The Bible says uh, we should raise up a child when he's young or train a child when he's young. When he's old, he will not depart from biblical principles. So please, right now, please give your love gift. We're going to ask our song leaders to come. Jonathan, come on. Uh, Terrence, whomever. And give us a good song to help us with this contribution. Time is filled with swift transition and now no earth don't move can stay and be Amen, amen. I would hope that we're thankful to God for this gathering. Uh, these men who have stood before us and given their perspectives on various issues facing the church. And of course, we know we can't get it all in one night. And so that demands that we continue to study. Y'all yeah. all right? Yes, sir. Well, if you're not, just lie to me. Tell me you're all right anyway. But I know we're getting ready now to have church. Uh, and, and we're going to bring up the whirlwind yeah. from West End. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Bro, as I just thought about that, I think it clicks too. Yeah. Whirlwind from West End. This, this young man here has impressed me over the years. I have seen him grow uh, and just a very unusual preacher of the gospel uh, still has his head on straight 
and uh, he is leading uh, one of the fastest growing churches in the brotherhood. And we just appreciate that he is on our side. We can imagine the misery if he was on the other side. Amen. So we appreciate so very much the work that he's doing in the ministry at the West End Church. And also for him uh, succeeding Dr. Jack Evans. And we do know those are some big shoes to fill. And so he's going to work his way into the 12th of whatever size Dr. Evans wears. Uh, again, appreciate all of you being here tonight and uh, being responsive in all the questions that were asked. And we are hoping that uh, you can get to the bottom of your concerns uh, as we make our way towards heaven's gate. We'll get there after a while. Amen. But lastly, we're always going to have differences, so we're not going to get uh, caught up in that too heavily. But... Uh, Brother Office Hayward, uh, again, really needs no introduction. He has earned his way, very well respected, and certainly uh, someone I respect and love and have a great appreciation for him and family. Uh, and uh, I'm always citing his training and the way that he was aided in his development. Uh, and he was mentored. So we do know that that works. So we're going to ask the song leader who is doing an outstanding job. We appreciate you, my brother. Just the whole list, the whole front pew here uh, leading in songs. of Give us a song and a half. <laughs> is there such a thing as a song and a half, you know? Do your math. Amen. But who's coming up next? Well, let's do it. God bless you. Hallelujah, come on y'all to help me sing Hallelujah, well, you know he's worthy Hallelujah, come on everybody lift your voice and praise his name Hallelujah, well, won't you help me sing Hallelujah How many y'all know that the Lord is worth tonight? Hallelujah, well, you really
want to say this and this is pertaining to the vendors uh, these people have come from near and far uh, and we need to support them so when we leave out of here this serious business now they packed all this stuff brought it in so you can have a selection of things of, of niceties and shiny objects to take back home and but y'all are slow with the visitation and so we want you to go out there every one of you when you leave out of here go out there and support the people who packed up all that stuff. Come on, somebody. Amen. Uh, and let's support them. Your earrings and dresses and shoes and suits and ties and things. Well, I've been shopping myself. Amen. So we're going we're gonna to support? Say amen. Don't lie to me. Amen. So we want to support the vendors, each one of them. Now give us the half song and then we're going to bring up uh, Brother Haywood. Yes, sir. Amen. The half song. Salvation has been brought down. Yeah, 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 yeah. Y'all have to sing. Jesus gave his life for ransom. Young world cavalry. Great. 
or let the church say amen. We're just thankful to God that he has blessed us to see a day that we've not seen before. And we recognize that our God is an awesome God. And he's worthy uh, to be praised. Uh, we ought to praise God not only for what he does, but to praise him for who he is. And we're grateful for who God is. When you know who he is, then you don't have to be massaged into praise. Uh, you come prepared to praise him based on knowing who he is. I just need the song leader to start the song I'll take it over after that. And we just appreciate knowing who God is and what he means uh, to us and our soteriological reality that we have been saved from our sins. Yeah. I want to thank Brother Harold Gilmore for this wonderful venue and appreciate all the work that he's put in to make this a reality. I'm sensitive to the frustration of trying to orchestrate uh, a lectureship on any level. And we thank God for your patience and your time and for providing us uh, with this venue. We certainly appreciate the, um, uh, the panelists that just spoke on the forum, uh, very thoughtful, and we hope uh, you understand that discussions are supposed to provoke thinking. Um, and you're, you're not necessarily looking for someone to be in complete agreement with you. But if nothing else, it ought to encourage you to go study. And for that, we're just encouraged by uh, these great men. If you would, turn with me to Romans, the eighth chapter. And I'll uh, read several verses. Uh, I want you to bear with me. I'm not feeling the best, been struggling since I got here with um, this acid reflux that I struggle with and it makes it difficult sometimes to uh, to preach while you while you're having that episode uh, but we ask you to uh, bear with me on tonight and um, I tried to dress nice in case the sermon didn't go well I uh, praise Jesus Romans chapter 8 and, and first uh, I'd like to start reading at verse 18 and culminate that reading at verse number 28. Romans, the eighth chapter, verse 18, and culminate the reading at verse 28. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility and not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. For we do not know how to pray as we should, 
but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words and he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God and my verse is and we know that God new American standard version causes all things to work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose is that in your Bible I'd like to read one more text turn your Bibles to Genesis 50 and I want you to meet me in verse 19 Genesis 50 in verse 19 but Joseph said to them do not be afraid for am I in the place in, in the place of God as for you you meant evil against me but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Uh, the subject that I've been assigned is seeing God's hand in my story. Seeing God's hand in uh, my story. I want to suggest to you that um, we're living in to some degree uh, in this country, uh, some frustrating times. Uh, we find that the, uh, there is political disagreement. There is frustration uh, with the White House. There is violence as we just witnessed the shooting uh, in Las Vegas, uh, a shooting in Tennessee at a church. Uh, uh, natural catastrophes happening that's ruining people's homes and changing uh, their reality. And if you're not careful, a Christian uh, has to know how to navigate this concept that the Bible calls suffering. Uh, suffering is something where um, if you're not careful, if you don't know how to put it within a Christian paradigm, suffering can drive you from God yeah, yeah, yeah. rather than draw you to God if you're not careful about how to navigate the suffering that you experience. Yeah. Uh, I want to suggest to you that the devil uh, knows how to show up in your suffering yeah. in a way that is to promote driving you from God. It's important as a Christian to understand it's by faith that we come to God and it's by faith that we stay with God. And what the devil is after is your faith. And if he can arrest your faith, he can destroy your relationship with God. And so with that understanding, all of us are going to have to know how to navigate this thing called suffering because if you can't navigate it, the devil will use it to drive you from God rather than you be drawn to God. I hope uh, you understand what I'm saying because some of the most profound atheists uh, did not begin with questioning the Bible. They began by not knowing how to navigate a crisis. And because they did not understand how to navigate a crisis, it ended up causing them to question God and to question the Bible. And so you need to be clear, if you're not able to navigate suffering, then you're going to find yourself in a place where you are drawn or rather pushed away from God rather than drawn to God. I want to take that, uh, that concept and help you to understand the way you navigate suffering is you got to see God's hand in your story. And I want to suggest to you that it is God that knows how to navigate what you cannot control. So even when I experience suffering, I've got to trust that God is still sovereign over my situation. And so I want to take that and help you to understand uh, that there is a thing that's called providence. 
and you're going to have to learn how to trust the providence of God and his ability to navigate the circumstances of life that you cannot control. Well, uh, the book of Romans is one of Paul's great didactic epistles. Without question, when we're reading the book of Romans, we are reading a dissertation on what Paul calls the righteousness of God. I want to also suggest to you that Paul's purpose is in chapter 15. For as he is on his way to Spain, he wants to get help in his missionary journey. However, his theme is in chapter 1, where Paul says, I am a debtor to the Greek and to the barbarian, to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am now ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. When you study the book of Romans, it is the notion that righteousness is not earned, but righteousness is imputed. And it's important for us to embrace theologically that as I make my way to heaven, I don't get to heaven on my own righteousness, but I get there based on the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that righteousness has been provided because God treated Jesus as if he sinned so he could treat me as if I never sinned. That is the righteousness of God and the essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now that being the case, when you're reading the book of Romans, the first eight chapters are clearly doctrinal. And what Paul wants to do is help you to understand that when God brought you from slavery to sin to righteousness, he placed you under the law of the spirit. Romans chapter 8 makes clear we've been made free from the law of sin and death and we've been placed under the law of the Holy Spirit and that is the dominance of the Holy Spirit has set me free from the dominance of the law of sin and death. As Paul goes through chapter 8, he then makes clear to us about the work of the Holy Spirit and transitions and shows the practicality of that work even to the degree that the Holy Spirit makes intercession when we are praying to Almighty God. Now let me be clear that when you get to verse 28, he says God, or rather we know that all things work together. Uh, all things in the context must at least include my suffering. Because in the context, when you're in Acts, in Romans 8, 18, he says, my suffering is not worthy to be compared to the glory that's coming after. In other words, if you place suffering on one side of the balance beam and you place glory on the other side of the balance beam, my suffering does not have the same weight as the glory that's coming later when it comes to my eschatological reality. In other words, when you put suffering on one side, glory on the other side, the scale tips toward glory because my suffering doesn't have the same weight as the glory has, as God has coming for me uh, uh, when Jesus returns. So he talks about suffering in verse 18. The groaning of creation. He speaks about the spirit making intercession for my weakness. And later in the chapter, he says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And he mentions shall famine and all of those sufferings. None of those things are able to separate me from Jesus. Well, he says, my God is able to take all things, including your suffering, and make it work together for good. Now, now suffer, uh, work together. God can make all things synageo, work together, from which we get an English word, synergy. It is the idea that God can take things that seemingly are unrelated and make them work together for one purpose. Now, in that concept, we see providence. Now, God works two ways, church. God can work miraculously. 
that's outside of natural law. Uh, when Jesus walked on water, that was his ability to work miraculously. But God can also work within natural law. Now, when we talk about God working within natural law, that's God's ability to make this work with that and make that work with this within a natural context. Well, let me give it to you an example. You remember when Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. And you remember when he went up to Mount Moriah to sacrifice Isaac. It just so happened that while Isaac was under the knife, it just so happens that there was a ram that got attracted to a bush, probably saw some good vegetation. It just so happened that when he went to the bush, he got caught in the thicket. Around the same time Isaac was about to get killed. Y'all not seeing this. God had this situation over here and that situation over there. It just so happened that at the time that the ram got caught in the thicket happened to be at the time that Isaac was about to get killed. Well, God will make this work with that and he'll make that work with this so that Isaac can go free. God caused the ram to get caught in the thicket that was God working with a natural. Are they all saying that? So God, God, and some of y'all can relate to your own life where God caused some rams to get caught in the thicket at the time you needed it most. My God knows how to make this work with that and make that work with this. That's him working within natural law. Yeah. Now, that means I got to learn to trust God when I don't quite understand what's going on. I need to trust that he's able to make this work with that and make that work with this because he knows how to synagogue make things have synergy because God is able to make all things work together. Now that works and now let me help you. The text says he makes all things work together for good. It doesn't say your personal good. So whatever God is doing is not always about you but perhaps what God's trying to do through you because he makes all things work together for good all the suffering you may experience you need to understand God is working out his own purpose now now I don't have time but if you want to know what his purpose is it's right there in Romans 8 for whom he did foreknow he did predestine to be conformed to the image of his dear son and whom he did foreknow, did, did predestined, them he also called. Them that he called, he also justified. Them that he justified, he also glorified. In other words, God is working out his redemptive purpose. Are y'all following that? God is loyal to his own purpose, not always yours. Sometimes we try to make God conform to our purpose when really we need to be concerned with God's purpose. And whatever I'm going through within the context of my suffering, God is going to make that work out for good that is ultimately to forward his own purpose. Are y'all saying that? There was a man named Joseph. Well, well, Joseph was the son of Jacob. A favorite son. He had a coat of many colors. He happened to have a prophetic dream. And when he had his prophetic dream, he ended up telling that prophetic dream to his brothers. It just so happens that his brothers didn't like the prophetic dream that he articulated. For that dream had him exalted above his brothers. It just so happens that his father didn't appreciate the dream either. Because it had Joseph exalted above his parents and his brothers. It just so happened 
that when he went out to the field to go and see about his brothers, they created a trap and they, hold this in your pocket, they buried him in a pit. It just so happened that a band came by and sold him into Potiphar's house. It just so happened that when he got sold into Potiphar's house, his Potiphar's wife ended up lying on it. And it just so happened that this Joseph ended up in prison, but he ended up prospering even in prison. But it just so happened that Pharaoh had a dream that nobody could interpret. But it just so happened that only Joseph had the gift that Pharaoh needed. And it just so happened that God exalted him to the right hand of Pharaoh and it just so happened that there was a famine that was coming to destroy the Hebrew family. Hold tight. Ah. And in chapter 37, it's a story about Joseph. But in chapter 38, there's an episode about Judah. Judah within Joseph's story happened to be set up by his daughter-in-law named Tamar. It just so happened that he got set up by Tamar. She expected Judah, or rather uh, Jacob to make, uh, excuse me, Judah to make good on his promise. It just so happened that she posed as a harlot and Judah, as his custom was, went to sleep with a prostitute. Don't bother that. Ah, it, 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 praise God it's some things the Bible does not hide the frailty of man and it just so happened that he ended up sleeping with Tamar and had twins by the name of Perez and Zerah it is right in the middle of Joseph's story the question becomes what's the relationship between Joseph's story and Judah's story the Bible says the scepter would not depart from Judah neither the lawgiver from between his feet in other words the Messiah was going to come from Judah's family line if Judah dies then the promise dies God's got to do something to preserve Judah because if Judah dies so does the promise and y'all not following that because, because Judah begot Perez and Perez begot Zerah are y'all following this? And then from Perez line came Obed. And in Obed we get Jesse. And in Jesse we get David. And then David we get Solomon the king. And y'all not following me. In other words, if you follow Judah's line, you end up at Jesus. But if Judah dies, so does the promise. Which means Judah is the focal point of Joseph's story and everything happening to Joseph ain't about Joseph, it's about Judah's salvation. Ah, it just so happened that while Judah had his episode, that Judah begot Perez. And then you find Perez will get Boaz. Boaz will get Obed of Ruth. Obed will get Jesse. Jesse will get David the king. David the king will get Solomon of her who was the wife of Uriah. Solomon will get Rehoboam. Rehoboam, Abiah. Abiah, Asa. Asa, Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, Joram. Joram, Josiah. Josiah, Josiah Jaconias. About the time they were carried into Babylon. After they were carried to Babylon, Jaconias will get Selahathiel. Selahathiel will get Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel will get Abiah. All the way till you get to Jesus. Now, here comes a famine. Is about to destroy the Hebrew family. But God raised up Joseph to sit on Pharaoh's right hand. And Joseph struggled when his brothers came to him because Joseph was angry about how he was treated. And then God finally revealed to Joseph this thing, your dream was never really about you, but it was really about my purpose so he says at the end of Genesis 50 what you meant for evil all the suffering in the pit all the suffering at Potiphar's house all the suffering in prison all the suffering you went through what they meant for evil God meant for good now listen church it doesn't say it was for Joseph's good Sometimes 
we shout easier on what God is doing for us. And we don't shout too quick on what he's doing through us. Y'all not hearing me. We, we like the for us scriptures. Christ died for us. We love for us, but we don't want to shout on through us. And that's why some Christians are no good to their local church. Because when they come to a church, they're looking for what the church can do for them and not what the church can do through them. Y'all not hearing me on the day. Some of us got a selfish Christianity. And it's not about being used, it's about being babied by what God will do for me and not what I will do for God. So what you meant? Favor. God meant for good. God meant it for his own purpose. Look at the text. In Genesis 50, 19 and 20, it says, here's the purpose. To save many people alive. Joseph, what, what was you raised up for? I was raised up, come here, to save the very ones that betray me. I came unto my own, but my own received me not. My own buried me in the pit, but the next time they saw me, I was exalted on the right hand of Pharaoh. And now I've got to control my disposition because God raised me up to save the very ones that betrayed me. I think I see Jesus. I think I read where John said he came unto his own, but his own received him not. And I've come today to tell you when they saw Jesus get exalted, Christ had to save the very ones that betrayed him. Because Christ was not concerned with what was for him. He was concerned with what God was doing through him. Are y'all following what I'm saying? As I close, I hope you understand. Wow. Providence is learning how to trust that what God is doing, that I need to trust he knows how to make this work with that and make that work with this. I, I don't need to be overly concerned and lose sleep about who's in the White House. I need to trust that God can make this <laughs> work with that. And I know what you feel. I feel the same way that he is a malignant character. I feel the same way about the professionalism of his presidency. However, I trust that if God allowed him to become president, then in some way he'll make this work with that and make that work with this. I trust that God is working out his scheme of redemption. And I've come today to tell you that if you're a child of God, I'm done. You gotta learn how to understand God has already given you the victory. I trust that God has already fixed this fight where whatever is happening in my life and in your life, God has already fixed this fight. I'm reminded that in the game of boxing, well, when one team, one boxing constituency doesn't believe that their boxer can win, sometimes what they'll do is they will try to fix the fight. Now, which means all the fighters got to do is just hold on, don't stay down. As long as you keep getting up, this fight is fixed. You don't have to worry about how it looks all the time. It may look like you're not winning, but your job is just to keep standing. If you get knocked down, get back up. Because usually what they'll do is somebody behind the scene will go and pay a price and when they pay a price, they're paying a price to ensure that the fight is going to be won. So they're dependent on the price. And if the price paid was valuable enough, then all the fighters got to do is not try to be perfect. He's got to hold on even when he gets knocked down. Get back up because this fight is not dependent on your performance. 
This fight is dependent on whether you can hold on throughout the entire fight. I've come today to tell somebody, Jesus has already paid a price. And because Christ paid a price, I know it may not look good every time. I know it looks like it's not going well. But if I can hold on, if I can just keep my faith, I might get knocked down. But if I get back up and I hold on, God has already fixed this fight. And I've come today to tell somebody, this fight's fixed, baby. I said it's fixed. I don't have to be perfect. He's already, he's already fixed this price where the victory is already mine. As I leave you with this church, I'm done. No, for real, I'm done. I went to go visit a sister in the hospital some years ago. This particular sister. And it helped me because one thing that's easy for us is to pretend like we making it on our own strength. It's easy to fake it on Sunday. When I went to visit this sister, years ago when I first got in ministry, she couldn't breathe on her own. But in order for her to live, they had to hook her to this thing called a ventilator. And at the time I asked, what is that machine doing? The doctor said, because she doesn't have the strength to breathe on her own, her breathing is dependent on what she's connected to. And while it looks like she's breathing on her own, it has nothing to do with her strength. It has to do with what she's connected to. So when you see her breathing and you see her chest moving up and down, that has nothing to do with her. But it's got everything to do with what she's hooked to. I've come to tell somebody when you see me in church and you wondering how I'm making it I may have just gone through a divorce but I'm still coming to church I may have gone through being laid off but I'm still praying if you're wondering how I'm making it and you're wondering why I still got a song in my spirit it's not about my strength it's about what I'm hooked to and because I'm hooked to God and because I'm hooked on his power I'm all right in church it's not by my strength it's not by my might I wish I had two or three witnesses that can admit right now when you was in church last Sunday it had nothing to do with your own power or your own strength it had everything to do with what you was hooked to and I'm glad when you see me on Sunday morning sometimes me and the wife just had a bad fight and we both in there because of what we hooked to you may have just got laid off whatever it is I need you to know God can bring you through all your suffering if you know how to stay hooked to who God is if you're here stand with me right now Stand with me right now. If you're here, I know it's a lectureship. Say it. But if you need prayer, because you're going through a fight, then I need you to know it's fixed. I need you to know your survival is dependent on what you're hooked to. And I'm going to ask you to depend on the reality that God can make all things work together for his purpose and he's working out his redemptive purpose sometimes through your suffering let me leave you with this question Joseph was raised up for Judah Judah would have never been saved had it not been for what God did for Judah 
who has God raised up? Or rather, have you considered if you've been raised up to save somebody else? Who has God put in your story that he's raised you up in order to save them? I need you to consider that as we close on today. If you're here and you need prayer, I want you to come. If you want to be baptized for the remission of your sins and give your life to Christ, put your faith in Jesus and then be baptized for the remission of your sins and the Lord will add you to the body of Christ. If you need prayer, I want you to come as we now sing the song of invitation. Without you, Lord, Without you. praise the mighty name of Jesus. Is there one that needs prayer? One that's saying, it's my day, it's my hour. God will save you, they'll save you right now. God will save you. If you need prayer, we want you to come. God is a mighty good God and he's worthy to be praised. Had it not been for God in my life, what would we do without God? Thank you, Lord, for your hand in my soul. God is good, sir.
We ask, dear God, that you might bless us respectively according to our needs. Special blessing, dear God, on Brother Haywood for coming to us, dear God, and pouring out his heart, emptying himself, dear God, that we might be blessed and that through his efforts you might be glorified as you deserve to be. And Father, just bless this entire gathering, but Gilmore for all he has done and those who have worked with him, uh, Father, laboring to give us a successful gospel endeavor. And we stand in great appreciation for him. Go with us now, dear God, as we uh, come to a point of announcements and closing out this meeting tonight. Uh, help us, bless us, forgive us of our shortcomings. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Brother Terry Wallace has a few words he wants to uh, give us concerning next year's lectureship uh, in the great state of Mississippi. Amen. And he's coming now to give us uh, the things that he has prepared. Again, did we have a good time tonight? Yeah. Brother Hayward, you did it again. Yeah. Great job. Let me tell you, we're doing pretty good. We're about 32 short of that 100 mall. And the 100 person, amen, will get a beautiful basket, amen. But you won't know that until tomorrow night. And amen. And then on top of that, the last person to register, the last person to register before this conference is over, get a free night. Amen. A free night at the hotel. Now, I need you to know this 120 ends on tomorrow night. Everybody's trying to get a free one. But listen, it goes up after that. You don't want to spend 160, 185. Amen. You want that 120. So don't walk by that desk and say, I see you. I got you. I'm coming. Be there tomorrow. Tomorrow might be too late, and then you'll be calling for another rain. Join us in Jackson, Mississippi. October the 1st through the 4th. We're planning to have a great time. Laboring under the thing, my enemy is my enemy. And we're planning to have a great time just to have it right here in the hospital. We're going to at this time stand for closing prayer. And we want all the preachers uh, and elders uh, and those who are leading your congregation in whatever capacity to stay in this room because we're going to approach the throne of God specifically for church leaders, uh, men folk. Amen. <laughs> so we going to allow for the sisters to make your way to the vendors and, and register to the outer corridor. Yeah. You can fellowship uh, and exchange ideas and niceties one with another. And the brothers will remain in this room uh, for a much needed prayer session. And I believe that Brother Howard Wright has some things he wants to say something like that, Howard. Let the church say amen. amen. Brother O did a magnificent job tonight. Amen. It's been a good day all day today. We thank God for it. Dr. Gilmore, Talk to me about this tremendous idea of having a preacher's prayer meeting. We're meeting tonight. We're right on time. And we want to give preachers, not members, but preachers, a chance to talk to preachers before we talk to God. We want to come close to the front. We don't need anybody in Tacnito pretending to be a preacher. <laughs> Amen, somebody. Come on, sir. We're going to allow elders to stay. My good friend has already put that out there. But they keep We're going to let elders pray uh, and talk.
But let's be careful, let's be careful that we're not like the deacon who confessed his shortcoming uh -huh. while the elder and the preacher confessed theirs. His shortcoming was gossip. And he said he couldn't wait to get back to the church and tell them what the preacher and the elder already said. Let's make this a Las Vegas experience in the sense that what is said here will stay here. Amen? Amen. Short verse of the song is standing up. We're going to say a dismissal prayer, and we're going to have everybody leave except preachers and elders. Elders and preachers come to the front. One more time, one more time, he allowed us to come together one more time, yeah, one more time, one more time, and he allowed us to come together one more time. Righteous Heavenly Father, you've allowed us to gather this one more time, and we're thankful and appreciative that you've been as good to us as you have. You've been better to us than we've been to ourselves. We thank you for this great lectureship. We thank you for this great week. We thank you for these great speakers of the gospel and preachers of the gospel who've poured out their hearts to this August audience. We ask a special blessing tonight on the rest of our evening that we'll get the rest that we need. Bless us as we go into the last day of this great lectureship. Bless our prayer meeting tonight. Bless every preacher that's here tonight. Bless elders that are here tonight. Bless us as we share some of the struggles that we have with ourselves, with our family, in our home, in our career. And help us to pray prayers of faith that will heal and realize that it is the effectual fervent prayer of just one righteous man that, that will avail greatly. And if we all pray as righteous men, God will hear from heaven. Thank you again for your Son and our Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.